for those of you who uh, haven't been on one of these conversations before with us, uh, my name is Nick Richmeyer. I'm from Culture Craft. We uh, work on really high level brand and strategy for organizations to help them navigate the incredible headwinds of what's happening in the current environment and to help you find your place in an increasingly complex economic uh, environment. Um, we've got Dustin Brusnack on the call. He is the founder and leader over at Modern Logic, who's really uh, kind of does many things in terms of um, mobile app development, but their primary uh, value proposition is really helping to create digital communities um, that, that you and, and uh, folks that you engage with can own and manage uh, and benefit from. Um, and then I've got Marty Constant on here. Uh, Marty and I have known each other for a long time and Marty really has some of the most incisive and, and clear headed thoughts around where workplace culture is going. Uh, she's a workplace futurist and deals with both the employer side and the employee side in terms of coaching people how to make the most of the current hiring and employment environment. Um, and her expertise is rich there, but also has worked in technology, also has background in marketing, so has a lot to bring to the conversation today as well. Um, we we want to jump right in here to kind of headwind number one. And really, this is the, the piece that sets the tone for almost everything that we're doing. And that is that um, we are all today, more so than ever, uh, subject to a world where big tech is dominating our decisions as businesses, right? As, as one thought leader recently put it, Google's never going to ask you to do to buy less Google ads. <laughs> um, the, the, the ecosystem that we all live in, the, again, the fact that we're on a Zoom call, that um, you probably found out about this through the giant platform of LinkedIn, all of these massive digital platforms that are empowered by the digital marketing uh, revolution that's happened over the last 15 years has created both opportunity and challenge for businesses like yours. And what we want to do just in terms of this discussion with the group is really have uh, Marty and Dustin, that would love you guys to just speak to where you're seeing this kind of big tech headwind play out in the conversations you're having and in uh, the people you're engaging with. And then we'll kind of take the conversation where it heads from there. All right, sounds good. Do you want me to just jump in or? Yeah, you, um, go, you, you give us a start there, Dustin. That sounds great. Okay, let us know if you see a, a headwind in the, in the chat that someone mentions that's sort of topical and that you can bring in, Nick. Feel free to Absolutely. interrupt me. Um, so yeah, just um, my, my original take on this or my, my take, what I'm seeing in the field is there's change across the board from a technology standpoint. Everyone's working remote. And so as you can see, we're not on Zoom video because we had a Zoom video issue with the webinar. Um, and that is affecting literally everyone at the same time. And so at least there's some empathy around, oh, you're on mute. I think everyone's probably heard that a dozen times over the last uh, you know, year or so, maybe 1,200 times. And so we have moved to this digital remote first culture and that has run our teams. It has changed the way we interact with our clients. So if you are in a B2B environment like I am, it means that you're no longer sitting across from the person in most cases uh, over a cup of coffee or over a lunch or at a presentation table. You've now got them in a little box sitting on your desk. And as a business owner, when you're hiring, um, most all of my hires over the last two years have been completely remote all the way through the interviewing process, all the way through the uh, formal offer. Oftentimes, I've never met some of our employees. And that has allowed me and the benefit there is I've been able to hire outside of Minnesota, uh, far away. But the the drawback is the things that traditionally I was relying on, like body uh, feedback, feedback on uh, facial structure, body, the millisecond response time in, in Zoom, all that stuff is very different when conveyed through a screen. So how do you build a culture now that everything is done remote when you're used to dealing with things in person? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? And then in terms of managing and talking to our customers, even in a B2C environment, we live in an environment that not just because we're remote is increasingly noisy because the tech platforms are getting so big. They have billions of users. 
ads are everyone is being told to buy ads through Facebook, through Google, through Apple ads. And now the not only is it expensive to buy that, getting into the real estate of your users, your consumer's head is incredibly difficult right now because there's so much noise in the platform. So I think there are three major pieces to think of, which is how we do business with each other, how we manage our culture and, and work internally, and then how do we deal with our customers? And in this new environment, how do we take these remote first, high tech, noisy situations and turn them into advantages for our businesses, increase our versatility instead of decreasing our versatility. And instead of sitting and asking, what do we do next? Thinking in terms of how does this new world, how do we create advantage in this new world, right? So that's kind of the context in which I think about it. And I think in each of these uh, these subjects that we're about to discuss, we can sort of cross those, those three platforms. But I'm interested, Marty, do you have any thoughts on uh, what's what's your thesis on this stuff? Sure. Well, as a futurist, um, I, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was sitting on an airplane and um, I was thinking about the whole agile software development process, which has impacted a lot of how we build our businesses today. And I asked the question, um, why can't this be applied to careers. And so I invented the term career agility 10 years ago, and um, no one quite understood it then, but I was operating in a technology environment where everything that's going on, like software development, impacts you and me and everyone else. So let's just take this remote, remote first or remote some of the time. Um, it is confounding to me that we have been working in distributed teams for 25 years and we're all up in arms as how to deal with it. The only difference that's happening right now as a headwind is there's more of us that are able to do it because of the capabilities of technology. Had we had COVID 15 years ago, we would have had a harder time adapting. Our productivity would have gone in the tank immediately. So I think the biggest headwind is how are we going to continue integrating these changes versus fighting about it? Um, and if any of you are hearing noises in the background, I'm just uh, two blocks away from the air show training today. So I'm hearing loud roars. I'm hoping that you're not hearing as much of it. Um, but, th but that's what I see. And then the other thing is to add to it is everything I hear today is when am I going to talk to a human? When is the earliest time that I can talk to a human? So I think we as companies have to be mindful of how we're going to be integrating these technology solutions into our processes. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most important components to think about either when you're talking to both your employees or your customers, which is how do we show up and be human in an environment where the, the new process is less human than ever, right? Where users, there's an entire, maybe two whole generations of users that don't want to speak to a human. And yet they're incredibly tech savvy and they understand when they're talking to a bot and they understand uh, when, when they're working with a service that isn't, doesn't have that sort of human level connection. And so they're simultaneously less interested in communicating with us in the way that maybe those of us who are a little older, uh, who have started businesses are used to them communicating with us. Uh, and, and simultaneously they're, they're much pickier about us showing up and making genuine connection with them, which is one of the reasons why at Modern Logic, we've started to really become big proponents of creating communities that connect with your customers, because you can't rely on Twitter, Facebook, on chatbots anymore in order to 
hold and, and capture that that engagement because one, it's really noisy, and two, the the, the standard of quality and human connection is is much higher now, and it's much harder. You know, it's harder than it's ever been because it used to be you just pick up the phone and call someone. Now it's text messages, it's um, live chat, it's video, um, and so the the requirements have really distinctly changed. So. Marty, I think one of the, the questions I have for you is how do you, when you're thinking about agile workforce and you're thinking about, you know, building out uh, sort of this sort of hybrid culture, this, this digital culture, how do you think in terms of agility and showing up as a human in an environment where maybe your 25-year-old consumer doesn't want to talk to you, they literally do not want to speak with you? I, I think, you know, having worked in marketing most of my career, the famous phrase is meet people where they are and to fight less and resist less in the way that people operate today. And so, you know, there's multiple channels. There was a time when we didn't use text, text marketing. There was a time when we didn't use all, all, any of that. There was a time that we didn't even use the mobile devices we had back in 2007. We didn't even we didn't even have a smartphone. So I'd say it's adaptation to that. Um, I come from a really big family, and I also know a lot of people across the ages. And I am very respectful and mindful of how people want to be communicated to do. If they want to be communicated via text. As a marketer, I'm going to want to communicate to them in that way. If they're going to want to meet in open source communities, as a lot of the engineer buyers were that worked on purchasing mobile security software in my last role, I made certain that we were in those communities. Um, back to Nick, and I'd love to hear what Nick has to say about this. Big tech will say, okay, ads. I remember trying to use Google ads and I had really smart marketers and SEO consultants and they had me buying ads. And I, I realized pretty quickly, you know what? It's, it's like the opposite of how an engineer does not trust ads. Why did I even experiment? Um, I wrote a book. I, I, I got on the Amazon bandwagon for ads. And yes, I could make money. I could make 10% more than I was spending. But who the hell wants to spend a thousand bucks on something so you can make a hundred bucks? It just doesn't even make sense. It's too much time, effort, and energy. So I got off of that train. So I would love to hear what Nick has to say about this, because he has a lot of ideas about um, why we shouldn't hop on this same bandwagon just because big tech is doing it. I worked in Silicon Valley. It's like, it's easy to get caught up in that. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the, <clears throat> yeah, the past, uh, Marty. I, I think where we have to start is we have to look at where the incentivization systems are today. And you know, even if you were talking about buying digital ads and, and using the platforms to grow your business five years ago, there was a really keen argument to be made for what you're describing, probably not spend a thousand um, to, you know, spend a hundred to get a thousand or spend 900 to get a thousand, right? But there, there, you could really make a strong case in a lot of situations for what is often referred to as marketing arbitrage, right? So that arbitrage is you spend some to get some, but the reality is you can do it forever. So as long as you get the ratios right, you have this sort of unlimited ceiling of growth as, uh, as long as you get the ratios right and you can be really clear on who your total ad addressable market is. The problem is that that uh, entire um, system was based on a series of incentives for the big tech companies that have now come into collision course. So that those incentives were that, that the Facebook and the Googles and all of these businesses were heavily incentivized to trade human privacy for advertising revenue. And there was a period of time where we were all cool and kosher with that. We're like, yeah, cool, yeah, 
my privacy, who really cares, or I don't know, or I'm not thinking about it, or whatever. And, and in mass, and this was guaranteed to happen, it was just a matter of when, in mass, the buying public, and that includes those of us on this call, have made the decision little by little and in varying degrees that that's not a trade that we're super excited about, right? So there's ad blockers and there's all of the features that Apple is inserting and, and the perverse reconstructuring of Instagram and Facebook so that you actually have to struggle to connect with who you wanna connect with. Your primary uh, way you're getting battered is with strangers and with paid content. And so the incentive systems are fundamentally anti-consumer in the current environment. And so the more you participate in those systems, the more you're dependent on things that are anti your buyer, right? And you, you merge that with what Dustin was saying earlier, that the expectations for the quality of connection are higher than they've ever been, particularly for people under 40, but that is aggressively shifting up in age. And Marty's comments about uh, the desire for the feeling of a human connection, even though I may not actually want to talk to a human, all those things combined create this, the, the exact headwind that we're talking about is the more you as a business sell yourself out, not willfully, but just because that you feel like that's your only option to the big platforms, the more you are dependent on them and the way that they're framing your, your customer and that there, there's, a, there's a vicious cycle there that's incredibly difficult to escape once you're in it. Yeah, and I'd add that we had this idea that we were connecting with our customer through the, through the purchase of ads because Facebook, Google, they let us really micro-target our campaigns against specific interests and specific types of people. There, there's one marketer who it's t said targeted his friend with, with an ad on Facebook, just specifically this one individual. And through a combination of privacy laws, policy changes, and just uh, sheer t you know volume, we have now lost the ability to do that. And what we've realized as business owners is we never actually owned that understanding of our customer. Facebook did, Google did. And I think one of the other pieces of this is how much do you really know about your consumer? Are you letting another platform own the experience of your consumer in terms of the ad delivery that's in their, their website, but also in terms of the data that the consumer is willing to give you, but is now giving this third party, which is charging you nickel and dime for every bit of information that you want on your consumer. You don't own that data. And if you don't own that data and they change their policies, now you've, you're in a position where you are on the back foot and you it really created the situation where you kind of had to be in bed with Google and Facebook because they're the ones that own the data. They're, they're the ones that own the user base. And now because I've advertised into that and I've got more users, um, you know, you, you were in a situation where they now even have even more. And now you're building their platform for them and they own the data and the price is going up and up and up. And one of the experiences, the, the other component is just the price, right? When I started building social networks, it was $2 to buy an install, right? Now it's $25, $50, $80 to buy one user. And there's just no way your customer lifetime value fits that. And so you've given all this power to them. And now the marketplace has exceeded your ability to pay for it. And in addition, the, the governments are taking away our ability to, to instrument and understand users through those, through those experiences. And Facebook is responding and, and Google is responding by making it harder and harder to gather that information yourself and own that data. And you know there is a way to own data about your consumer, to have empathy for them, to have compassion for them in a way that they are willing to engage with you on. And that involves basically owning your own community and thinking outside of the box that these big tech platforms have tried to put us in. And it's not that they're bad. It's that you have to think in terms of what their financial incentives are yes. to keeping you sort of engaged in that treadmill of user acquisition. Yeah, that's right. Again, this isn't about picking villains and demons and all of that. It's about fundamentally understanding that economies produce incentives. And when those incentives happen at scale, 
uh, at the scale of big tech, which honestly we've rarely seen in the history of Western economies. I mean, maybe not since the era of you know, Standard Oil. Have we seen such fundamental players in the way the world works have such uh, sway over all of our lives? And it's, it would be foolish to not fundamentally address their incentives and where those incentives lead them. And they're not gonna be the same places that you want to go. Now, we promised that as, as a, you know, a heading of this discussion is that we're going to talk about how these you know, um, headwinds can actually be tailwinds. And I think this really leads us to, to where Marty was heading in terms of accepting where the future is going, that technology is the future, and that we don't have to become subservient to these massive platforms to actually capitalize on the scale of technology that's available to us. So this isn't an anti-technology message. This is actually at the pace of innovation, businesses much smaller than ever before have the tools to build technological solutions to their business problems in a way that they never could before without outsourcing their success to third parties that may or may not have their best interests at heart. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. The technology has democratized access to the consumer in a lot of ways. You just have to go about it differently in terms of user acquisition. But once you've acquired that consumer, your ability to relate with them is so much better than it ever has been before. And if you think in terms of compassion, if you think in terms of empathy, if you put yourself in the shoes of the person that's interacting with you and think, how do they want to engage with me? We have, we are literally in people's pockets, right? Um, and you can tell where they are, you can tell uh, what they're doing in a lot of cases. And if you are a good steward of your of your customer and you, you really work hard to align with them, uh, that allows you to have a more intimate connection with your consumer. They will be much more loyal to your brand in ways that they weren't before. They will purchase more. They will engage with you more. You just need to give them the opportunity to do that. You effectively need to show up where they are instead of trying to go and get them to show up where you are, right? And that's sort of the major sea change I see and I've seen in technology over the last 20 years of being a technologist is we used to build these platforms and even mobile apps and expect people to come to us or we used to go and pay a ton of money for ads to acquire them and get them to come to us. Um, and we didn't think in terms of how do we actually enable and help them show up more? How do we show up more authentically in their communities? And then once we've captured the consumer, how do we turn that into an experience that really enriches their lives so that, that, so that we're making people's lives better? Because whatever product you have, whatever you're selling, the end goal of any, any company is to make someone's life better in a way that they're willing to exchange value for, right? And we have so many more tools at our disposal now with just the access to a laptop and a mobile phone than we ever did before. And really, you need to think in terms of, OK, yes, it's harder to acquire these users, but I'm acquiring better users. And the companies you see falling out are the ones that are either trying to fit that old mold of they're just going to show up because they need it. Or, you know, they they, for whatever reason, refuse to to have that focus on that authentic experience you're having with your consumer, right? Um, and that's really what I, I see as the main point, the main cultural changes. I talk to a lot of founders of older businesses who, you know, between their employees and their clients want to keep doing it the old way. And that's, that's human and that's natural, but um, there's just so much more value in being versatile and being agile and really thinking in terms of, is the user going to want to do this in line while they're waiting for their coffee? Are they going to do it in their car, a hotel room? Are they doing it at their house, right? Like what, how does the user want to show up in what stages do they want to interact with me? And if you can really put yourself in their shoes, you can create super sticky, super engaging platforms that people love. I think, I think it's listening to people, um, listening to what they have to say and, you know, Larger companies may have different ways of aggregating that data as a mid-sized company or even a smaller company. 
let's talk about scheduling time with customers and clients in a way, I, I call it the market validation of your product set or what you're going to be launching next quarter. There's a lot of build it and they will come mentality that still exists with entrepreneurs that say, this is a really good idea and not really understanding what the customer really needs, not getting to know them on their turf and in the way that they want to operate. Do they want to operate in the metaverse? Do they want to operate in different scenarios than you currently have available to them? And to understand that in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'm not talking big focus groups, I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one meetings on a quarterly basis with some of your key customers and a way to talk to some customers that you don't have as customers yet. It's an invitation. We would like to hear what you have to say so that we can better build our product offerings to meet the needs of the market. So I think um, there, there's a lot going on right now. And then you also have to balance that with, let's call them headwinds, let's call it change, but balance that with the winds of change of technology that is inevitable, it is seeping in. I noticed Paula Weigel is in the audience here and she's very heavily involved in AR and VR events. Now you can talk about advertising, you can talk about having meetings in the metaverse, but there's a lot of things that are important the, the metaverse is being designed by people that are across the ages, that are slanted um, you know, younger, and they will be running the work universe in about five to 10 years. So if we're not um, starting to, uh, to design for that now and listening to what they want in advance of the, the full-on trend, uh, right now, they may be a little bit more signals, but when it's a full on trend, you've missed the mark. Right. Yeah. And I think paying attention to not only new technologies, but how are the how, is, how are people using technology and how do they want to use technology? Uh, and to, to reiterate and underline your, your customer interviews idea, people are more willing to talk to you than you think. Right. And with mo the modern economy, People are very opinionated about what they like and they don't like. They, they're not going to be told what their opinion is anymore, right? They're going to show up and they know what they want. They're very educated because they have access to the internet uh, and because they have access to more data than ever before. And so if you say, hey, let's sit down, let's have a conversation, I think most businesses think that that is harder than uh, than it really is. We have one customer that's doing a thousand individual user interviews over the next year. Right. And that is an important part of their product development life cycle. And it's making huge, a huge difference in what the feature set, what the production is, you know, how he wants to show up. Because as the product owner is thinking about his business, he doesn't have to guess. Right. And the worst thing you can be doing is sitting here guessing what your user and your consumer want. Go ask them because most of the time you're wrong. I mean, people have emotional responses to things. They're very educated. Uh, and you're basically approaching it from an economic perspective. How do I sell into this? And oftentimes you miss that human perspective of even if it makes no logical sense, the user just wants the button there and they want to do it here and they want to do it in this way because that underlines and highlights and reinforces who they are and how they feel and not so much might the economic you know underpinnings of that which is what's driving your business so i think that's important and then when you talk about metaverse you know metaverse is really fascinating and right now what i'm seeing as a technologist is we don't really know where it's going to go but it's definitely going somewhere and there's this really amazing feeling of play on the technology side and you're seeing people try all sorts of different things and they're playing uh, both from a user standpoint and a business standpoint and a technology standpoint to try to find where the culture is going. And it's really important as a business, if you if you can spare the time to sort of get in there and, and look at those, those things and play with that technology and talk to your users about how they feel about it, where they think it's going, and really engage. Understanding, of course, that it is still early. So 
you, we, we, none of us have a crystal ball. We can't see what's going to happen 10 years ago. When, when the mobile phone came out, you know, one year before the mobile came out, I was at Adobe doing digital photography and there was still an open question of whether film photography was going to be a thing, right? And then the iPhone came out and everyone became a digital photographer. And I think we're going to see that in 10 years with the metaverse. How that's going to play out though, we don't know. But if you're sitting here early enough, you have the opportunity to make small investments in that stuff and also to talk to your consumer and get ahead of the ball in terms of that adopting that technology so that when you do, when this stuff does hit big, when that generation that wants to put the headset on is ready, you are you are prepared and you have a strategy for that. Because again, you know, AR, VR, you're showing up, you're creating a world for someone to inhabit. Uh, and that is an important responsibility and it's a very intimate experience for them. And if you do that well, you're going to be creating lifetime buyers. I give it, I give it three years not 10. Um, we've been in, if you take virtual reality, we wouldn't have the pilots we have today flying planes without some sense of immersing themselves in a universe that we may not have had access to, and it continues to improve. We wouldn't have that kind of test and measure in immersing yourselves in an experience, you know, like, like you do in digital twin environments. Buildings, smart buildings are built this way. This technology is real right now. So I would suggest it's not really five to 10. I would suggest it's three to four years as a futurist, I see these things happening. I know people that are delivering this. And I don't want this conversation to digress into the metaverse. I would love, since Nick is facilitating this conversation, to rein us in, Nick. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think actually we, we hit the right zone here on some of the more forward-thinking pieces, the metaverse. There's an, actually, to me, a in, really interesting intersection between, uh, like, AR, VR, metaverse kind of a topic and um, uh, interviewing your customers. Uh, you, some people might not see a Venn diagram there, but I actually see a really clear one. And that is that and it really gets to what really our next big headwind here, which is the resource headwind, right? So big tech is not going to save us. Everybody's got to figure out where their dollars are. And the reality is everything's more expensive for less value than we used to get. And that's not going anywhere, right? So we talked about a digital ad today is going to provide you substantially less value than it did five years ago. And it's not going to get better um, because the incentive system has broken, right? It's going to be more expensive to hire talent today than it was last year. And that's not going to get better, right? That, that sense that your dollar as a business buying services from other businesses or hiring town or whatever it is, your dollars have to stretch farther. That resource headwind is fundamental. And what the big technology lie would tell us is that the only way to do that is to do big scale solutions. And when you're in the middle market, if you're a business below 100 million or you know, even more substantially, if you're a business below 25 million, what that immediately raises is how the heck are we gonna resource something, you know, and experiment into the metaverse, right? Well, where are these, these pieces that you've raised crisscross each other is that the answers actually aren't big scale solutions. The answers are in solutions that don't scale. Interviewing customers is not a scalable solution. You cannot do that in mass. You have to have a, if you're gonna interview a thousand people, you have to have a plan. You have to have humans. You have to have a system to do that. But the value that you're going to extract from that is 10,000 X what you would get from some automated survey, right? So that these non-scalable solutions, what the experiments people are running in digital currency, in Web3, in metaverse, those experiments are incredibly expensive and are funded by people that have cash to burn. But we can learn from them by being students of other people's experiments. Now that's a non-scalable activity. You only have so much time of what to read and who to study and who to follow. But by doing it, we can become students of where things are going and then know where to leverage our um, really stretched resources. Because that resource headwind, more things costing more than they've ever cost and businesses having to be more uh, solution oriented is is real 
And I think the more we can think about solutions that are intimate and personal and uh, hyper creative that may not scale actually produce better solutions today than the promise of do everything at the biggest possible scale for the you know least amount of money. Um, but I'd, I'd be curious about you all's take on that and how you're thinking about the, the resource reality that businesses are facing in the midst of all this as well. I love this. I, I, tell you, I think about this all the time. And I think the, the best way I can put this out would be to say businesses in the past scaled based on getting more and more consumers, right? And if you set up a, a financial structure, an economic engine, which is what a business is, and its goal is to scale the top line value and the bottom line value based on customer acquisition, based on ad spend, you end up in this situation where you're spending 50, 60% of your available budget on marketing, on user acquisition, on these things to design to get more people. And so your whole model now is predicated on the acquisition of consumers. And we see this with Twitter, we see this with Facebook, we, and we see this with pretty much any sort of middle market solution in manufacturing and sort of across the board. Now, now say the cost of acquiring that consumer goes higher, right? Or the consumer becomes more thrifty, more, more, more savvy about spending, right? You have created a business that is designed to deliver marginal advantage based on unit economics that is scaling on a particular number of people. And so by definition, almost, you're building a business that is designed to eke out an advantage in by, act, by acquiring so many people, which means you've made trade-offs, like, for instance, the per user lifetime value might be lower. And now we're seeing a, a world where things are so much more expensive, where users, not just in terms of money, but in terms of time, attention, that users uh, that acquiring the consumer is now much more expensive. And that fundamental model where you can sell a thousand widgets for a penny each and make your money doesn't work anymore because it's just not possible to deliver value because the prices have shot over your ability to deliver that advantage. Everyone you've competed with is in the same world. And that is actually an advantage that you can take advantage of now. Talking about turning this into a tailwind, right? The fact that your consumer unit economics are built around making more money by acquiring more customers means that if you can think about making more money with less customers by creating a more genuine experience, by creating yes. repeat buyers, you are going to have an advantage and you're going to have to do it on a smaller scale, which will give you versatility and agility and customer loyalty in ways that those bigger businesses in the past weren't weren't capable of. And those dinosaurs are going to be the blockbusters. They're, yeah. they're going to die. And you're going to be sitting here with a smaller, more versatile business that is making more money on the bottom line than you were before. Because top line doesn't matter, bottom line does, right? So the market, the middle market has a huge advantage. Yes. I, I think they're, um, they're better listeners on many levels. Um, they're nimble. They're agile. They can flex with the future trends in a way they could do it in a matter of 90 days versus nine months to a year and get things off the ground. I mean, companies during COVID changed business models quickly. They were the middle market companies that were uh, coming out with new products. I mean, Zoom didn't come from a big, I mean, it's, it's now is part of a big company, but it didn't come from a big company mentality. These ideas and um, innovation come from the smaller and middle market. And there's a couple trends that are happening right now that I think are making this even more accessible to others. And it's this idea of, an open source mentality. And so if you are sharing what it is that you know about your industry um, in a way that you know, you're not giving away all your intellectual capital, but you're giving away concepts. You might even be giving away some platform ideas, like I'm struggling with this, but get it out into the open, get the problem solved from thousands and thousands of people across the globe. Um, and then bring it back into your company and market that product that you've put your signature on. I think 
middle market and small companies can do this. Yeah, I think you yeah. make a really, yeah, uh, just really quickly, and then Justin, I want to riff to you. I just, I want to validate just how important that point is, because I think you know, I'm looking at some of the folks on the call today, and it's so easy if you're in that small to mid market and think, well, gosh, you know, this stuff doesn't apply to me. This sounds like, you know, big, expensive, high concept ideas, right? But the reality is that your big competitor, your uh, big scale uh, behemoth in your industry is the least likely player to lead in the next 10 years, just by definition, because their ability to pivot is substantially lower than yours. And so we have never had in, in modern history an, an economy that was so heavily biased toward the small and mid market that the, like that the one is today. For a hundred years, every business believed that the best way to improve profits, bottom line profits was to scale. That getting bigger was the right answer to every problem. And that is no longer true. That the margins, the margins and the ability to pivot and engage customers is coming in anti-scale, um, moderate sized engagements because and that, that allow you to be much more resource selective because you're not basically buying your next dollar of revenue with, with these heavily scaled baked in activities. Sorry, Marty, go ahead. Or Dustin, I, yeah, I think Dustin, you were going to jump in. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, that that is a really important point. And it's not just because they're they have more people right it's because they've built an economic engine that just doesn't work in today's economy so uh, the concrete example look at your your local farm to table movement right you can make more money as a farm to table uh, restaurant and ecosystem than you can as a global uh, food deliverer now in terms of bottom line dollars sure they're going to beat you out but in terms of profit uh, in terms of, of overall, I mean, top line dollars, sorry, uh, in terms of overall profit, you can crush them on a percentage level by staying local and by delivering people a more authentic experience with better fruits and vegetables, with, with, more, with clear, clean, ethical sourcing, with these sorts of things. And it's not that the big companies aren't capable of this because they've got plenty of money. The problem is if they did it, it wouldn't impact their bottom line in a way that their shareholders care about at all, not for a decade. So it, they've created these sort of economic engines that require short-sighted thinking that if they can't roll a product out across a billion people, this is the Facebook problem, right? They can acquire more users because pretty much everyone they can acquire is on there. So how do you make more money? Well, you don't do it by doing smaller, more intimate connections with them. You have to do something that makes a, that hits big, which means a whole new product, which means billions of dollars of investment and years of development and research. And then it might fail, right? Whereas you as a middle market company, you can go and say, okay, I can get a hundred or a thousand users in this world and, and get them consuming. And I can increase my value by 20%. And that means something to me in my bottom line. And not only that, but it means something to your consumer in terms of actual meaning, impact, uh, creating change, making people's lives better. And if you focus on how do I make those people's lives better and less on scaling, more on how do I make the people I already have and the people in my community better? How do I create a better, you know, more intimate experience? How do I make their lives better? They're going to be willing to engage with you. And that's going to ultimately result in goodwill, which translates to profit, right? And I think we've forgotten that over the last hundred years. Yeah. You know, we fought for this scaling and we've lost sight of the fact that, you know, there is a person on the other end of this is making a buying decision. And any of us who bought gas or who pay for our electricity or, you know, buy, you know, natural gas, what's that experience like for you? And, and what would you be willing, how much more would you be willing to pay for, a, for an experience that was just flat out better where the person was thinking about the problems you were having in your house? Is it 10%? Is it 20%? Is it 30%? Because the consumer despite the fact that they're thriftier than ever, is willing to pay much more for experiences and for better experiences than they were in the past. Yeah, I, I want, we got 10 minutes left here and I wanna make sure we get to our last headwind and Q&A. So if anything that we've 
uh, talked about raises a question for you. If you uh, like have something that you're like, gosh, well, how does it apply to this situation? Or I would love you guys to riff on XYZ. Please use the Q&A section of the chat. Marty, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it to you because you live deeply in the human capital world. You know, our last headwind here is really the connectivity headwind that this sense of I want a human experience and that the platforms like we talked about that were supposed to provide that for us are increasingly dehumanizing and so uh, businesses now who've said, oh, well, we're going to connect with our customers on social media, or we're going to connect with our customers X, Y, Z way, are actually finding those platforms less connective and less ability to support what they're doing. And of course, all the you know, kind of work from anywhere and all those kinds of things. So we know, and it's a phrase that I often use called the givers of dams, that there are people who give a damn about your business. You give a damn, your customer gives a damn, your 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 employee team I, I, ideally gives a damn, but finding the right ways to create that connectivity is harder than it's ever been. Marty, you're in the trenches on this all the time. How do we turn that headwind into a tailwind and an opportunity for middle market businesses? Well, I, um, I ran this um, post uh, surrounding this topic, turning a headwind into a tailwind. And I, I use the example of running along the lakefront when you're running against, against the wind, you're in one of those running groups for a marathon training group, and you're running north and you've got a north wind in your face and you can hardly move. And it's gonna take you three times as long to run north. And the way to get around that on one particular day, I took a bus 12 miles north and I ran south. So I took the headwind, turned it manually into a tailwind. This is a metaphor for what we can all do. We can take the energy and power of what currently exists and turn it into an opportunity. So let's use the example of the ATS system, which is a barrier to entry for many people seeking jobs and for people trying to, uh, HR departments and recruiters trying to get really good people. So you wanna have a good employer brand and recruit all the right people, but something's broken. This, this ATS is, it's all keywords and it's not, human enough. And so what needs to happen is organizations need to make available to it some of this uh, concept of networking and referral basis. We all know that 80% of jobs that are gotten today are gotten through referrals. So clicking the, clicking your, your um, submission for trying to get a job these days, waste of time. Getting stuck in the ATS system, waste of time. So let's get, you know, a, an organization that works with the current trend of referrals being the better way and not um, taking that as a vetting requirement. Like why even have them bother filling out the ATS after the fact with all of that information. Why do you have to fill it out 10 times? Why can't it just be one time? So there's a lot of things organizations can do to make it simpler. And I just talked about the open market and job search right now, but it can also be um, relatable to the way that training is done for current employees. Why not have the kind of training that meets you where you're at. Let's not all start at the same place for training. If some people are more advanced, have them advance out of those modules and get right into the next modules. Don't make them go back to the beginning. Give them credit for what they already know. Yeah, and, and onto the applicant tracking systems, the thing I'd add there is, more and more of the applicant tracking system, I 100% agree, is working against the companies that are using them because they're machines and they're not even particularly smart machines. It's not like there's AI, right? Um, so if you need something and they're looking for a bullet point and your ideal candidate doesn't have that ideal bullet point, uh, it's not gonna, gonna come through. I have, I have a friend who is hiring for a rather large Fortune 500 medical company. They headhunted a candidate, it was perfect, got through the interview process, and they were waiting for that person to fill out some details in the ATS. 
and they were disappointed because that person had been a week and the person hadn't actually filled it out. It was a perfect candidate that they really wanted. And they went in and they looked at the ATS and it turned out they had filled it out. And the ATS hadn't sent the email because the, the, the candidate that they recruited, she had not, she was missing a single bullet point on her uh, educational background. And so the ATS said, well, you don't fit the requirements. So we're not even going to show it. And so they almost lost this candidate. They did manage to rescue it, but they almost lost this candidate because they let the tech get in the way of the human thing. And this is a person that they've gone after. And I think that's really important to understand for those of us who are trying to build more diverse employee bases that really match our communities. One of the other things to think about is, you know, what requirements are, are we putting into our job descriptions are, that are legacies of the 1990s or 1980s, 1970s thinking, do you really require a college degree with four years of experience? Or do you just require someone who can do the job, right? And how do you make those trade-offs? And that's a really big discussion that's happening in the Minnesota tech community right now, which is how much education do you really need? And the answer is, not any if you can do the job, right? If you have the right attitude and the right background and you've done the work, you know, a four-year degree is, is unnecessary. And so we're putting all of these things in the, and, and those, those requirements almost predominantly screen out diversity in addition to having all these other problems of getting you the right candidates. Uh, oftentimes the right candidate for you is a unique human being with a unique skill set. And the only way you're going to figure that out is by creating a personal connection. And I, the other thing I want to say to, 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 to switch to the other side, which is talking to your consumer, um, you know, you're, you're a producer of content, you're a producer of value. One of the ways that you can really engage your consumer is by looking at other ways to connect with them by creating a community that isn't in this noisy environment of Twitter and Facebook. And so that you're, you're taking your users that give a damn and you're allowing them to step outside of the noisy world and you're creating an environment where they can have safe honest, transparent, and, and, and empathetic discussions about the great things that you're doing, the great things that they're doing, the things that really matter to them. And that's what creates consumers that keep coming back. Yeah, that's really, really good. Um, I want to finish up with, I, we could talk for hours, but I want to finish up with this thought because I think it ties into what both of you are saying, both on the employee side and the, the customer side. And that is that um, again, we come out of the post-industrial legacy, right, of the late uh, 20th century and early 21st century that gives us the impression that, a, that there's only one way to build a business and it's now, and, and the idea was we'll just add technology to it, but the fundamental rules haven't changed. Well, what we now know, you know, uh, at this very late stage in the digital revolution is that adding technology to it actually changes the fundamentals of the way the game is played. It isn't just the industrial game plus computers on top, it is a fundamentally different game. And in the old game, the whole point was to build a product or a solution or a service that you could build a wall around that nobody else could compete with you. Nobody else can do what we do, right? And that wall could be geographic, that wall could be feature set, that wall could be, you know, uh, any number of things, even some people would argue that brand was used to build a wall uh, around a service. Apple to somewhat degree for a period of time used brand to build a wall around the iPhone, right? But the reality is that whole viewpoint, this is really the spirit of what we've been talking about the whole time, that we're trying to build a wall around, uh, uh, we're trying to build a wall around our service so we can scale it over and over again. That whole thing is completely undermined in the way things work today. And the actual thing organizations need to do, your organization needs to do, is to build a wall around your community. And that, that that garden wall of care, of how you're gonna connect with them, how you're gonna value them, how you're gonna engage them. And that community is the people your business impacts, that could be a literal physical geographic community, that's your employees, that's your customers, and creating places where we can turn these headwinds resource headwinds, connectivity headwinds, technology headwinds. And we go, actually, somewhere in all of this is opportunity. And that opportunity is to use technology in a hyper-efficient way that's not intended to scale the billions and billions of dollars to produce margin and profit so that we can build great experiences of high connectivity. That is the heart of what middle market businesses can do across the spectrum and across industries to turn these tailwinds into headwinds. 
We're up against time, gang, and I really appreciate it. We want to give you some next steps right here. So if you want to talk about how to create digital communities, make sure you give Dustin a call. Dustin's your guy. Uh, you've got his email there is up on your screen. And if uh, Marty's got a wealth of experience and knowledge in terms of uh, this, the workplace futurist work she does. She's a great public speaker. She works with businesses and on coaching and development. You have her email there to reach out. And then you guys all know how, I think for the most part, know how to DM me on LinkedIn, if that's the best way to connect. But we're running a program in October this year of how to apply everything you've learned today in a very efficient uh, four weeks, four sessions, our Grow Smarter um, kind of intensive sprint. And we'd love for you to get to know more about that and see if you be a part of that. It's at culturecraft.com slash grow smarter. Um, thanks for your time, everybody. We're going to actually put this recording out out in the wild where everybody can get it without a password, without a login, so that uh, we can uh, have others engage with this as well. Again, uh, thanks for your time today. And thanks, uh, Dustin and Marty, for your incredible insights. Thank you. This was great. Thanks. Bye.